Welcome, everyone. My name is Jen Wesson. I'm the executive director of the head of the Schuylkill Regatta. And on behalf of the board of directors and the committee 50, we welcome you to our second hour, uh, story hour of 2023. Um, just a little housekeeping items before we get started. We have a stellar lineup of guests this evening, so uh, I don't want to do most of the talking, um, but just a few housekeeping items. Um, we have everyone, uh, we have over 100 registrants tonight, over 150. Um, so we're going to keep everybody muted. You have the ability to unmute yourself at any point in time. Um, so if you have uh, something to add or a question to ask, you can go ahead and do so. Um, it, we just ask that you know you keep your background noise um, to a minimum, um, just so we can hear everybody um, uh, in their in their, when they talk. Um, be sure to put everyone on gallery view so you can see lots of lots of faces. Um, we've kept this platform Zoom, um, so we can see one another. It's been uh, really great to to connect people that don't get to see each other all that often. Um, and though we started during COVID, um, we found that people really enjoy um, making this connection throughout the year. I encourage you to keep your chat room visible off to the side and to use that chat room to add any comments to stories um, or speakers. Um, you can share you know, things that you wanna add to someone's story or if you have a question and I'll try to interject them um, throughout the evening so you can get those questions answered. We will allow uh, 15 to 20 minutes at the end. Uh, we'll probably wrap up around uh, between eight and 8.15, but we'll leave the last like 20 minutes or so, so folks can um, verbally ask questions. We'll allow everyone to, to unmute themselves at that point in time. Um, again, for those of you just joining us, we are um, recording this session, so it's available for those that are unable to join us tonight. Um, and we will post this on our YouTube uh, channel as soon as we get it uploaded. All right, as for the, the format of the program, again, we'll, we'll likely run about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our evening's facilitators and then they'll introduce our guests and get us uh, rolling on tonight's subject, which we're super excited about. Um, when, we, when we set out this year um, to, we really were, were centered around a theme of um, rowing archives and how we can preserve the history of our sport and the people and the places. Um, so uh, last last month we talked about just the, the need for archiving and, and a consistent uh, manner to um, collect materials um, around the around the country and around the world. Um, so we have a committee working on that right now. Uh, tonight we're we're delving into um, the history uh, before Boathouse Row. Um, you know how. Um, really American rowing came about um, in the in the places uh, that it thrived. So with no further ado, let's get rolling. Um, tonight, our uh, committee 50 members that are our facilitators are Christopher Doyle and Dottie Brown. Um, and they are a wealth of knowledge in their own right, um, quite the historians, um, and they really need no introduction. So I'm gonna allow them to take over from here and, um, and, and introduce the rest of our crew for this evening. So sit back, enjoy, and we're glad you're with us. Christopher, Dottie? Chris, do you wanna go? He's muted. Got him. Okay, yeah. I'll start. <laughs> So we have this um, great lineup of historians tonight. I'm introducing two of them. Um, and they both have tremendous interest and expertise in the changes that have taken place along the Schuylkill for, well, for centuries since the beginning of, of Philadelphia, actually. Lily Milroy has been a history professor at Wesleyan University, Drexel University, and is now a lecturer in the University of Pennsylvania's graduate program in historic preservation. Uh, she wrote, among uh, other books, uh, including some about um, my favorite art artist, Thomas Aikens, who painted the river, but she also did a, an all-encompassing book, The Grid and the River, Philadelphia's Green Spaces, 1682 to 1876. She's on the board of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and she's club historian for the Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club. I also am introducing Adam Levine, um, who is a historical consultant with a deep interest in horticulture and in water. And he became fascinated um, by that, the subject of Philadelphia's water when in 1997, as a journalist, um, 
for a story to appear on Friday the 13th, he toured uh, the Philadelphia sewer system and became fascinated. Um, he's worked closely for many years with the Philadelphia Water Department, uh, producing some wonderful videos that if you uh, Google his name um, and water, um, you'll find them online. And for the last eight years, he's been editor of the Pennsylvania Historical Society magazine. He's written five books on gardening. Uh, and uh, you can learn more about his work at his website, which he's been building for 20 years now, waterhistoryphl.org. Chris, your turn. Okay. I'd like to introduce Sandy Sorlane. Uh, Sandy is a native Philadelphian who has traveled and photographed the entire Schuylkill River Valley uh, throughout her life. She is the author of 50 Houses, Images of the American Road. Uh, Sandy's received three fellowships in photography from the Pennsylvania Council for the Humanities and two from the Athenaeum in Philadelphia. She has taught photography at the University of the Arts in several area schools. And you may, you may be asking yourself, what does this have to do with the, the Schuylkill Valley? Well, Sandy joined the Fairmount Waterworks in 2013, and she is currently working in the, in the education center, uh, which, which the Philadelphia Waterworks is the education center of the Philadelphia Water Department. And she serves as a watershed educator and an environmental photographer. Most recently, Sandy is the author of a really wonderful book called Inland, which is the story of the Schuylkill navigation system from uh, be, be, before the times of the dam all the way, you know, all, all, all the way up to, to the present day. Uh, Sandy, welcome. We're very glad to have you. Um, I'd like to introduce next Stephen Malbuff. Uh, Stephen is a historian of the Detroit Boat Club, and we are very interested in expanding our horizons among the 50 stories group to encompass other rowing activities throughout the United States. And Stephen is going to share with us some of his research that he's done about the early rowing histories in other places around the United States other than Philadelphia. Uh, the, the, the Detroit Boat Club is the second oldest surviving boat club in the US and it was founded in 1838. Uh, Stephen has a bachelor's and master's degree in architecture. His firm specializes in historical renovation and Stephen's main professional interest is in historical architecture. In the course of his duties at DBC, Stephen has studied and traveled extensively all over the country to explore the early history of American rowing. When you hear Stephen speak and you see his slides and his photos, uh, you'll see a broad body of work that he has accomplished, ranging from compiling a list of all the winners of all the events at the U.S. Rowing National Championships from the very first championship regatta in the 19th century. Uh, he has studied the architecture of the surviving 19th century boathouses all over the U.S., and he has explored the history of regional rowing associations throughout the country and has researched the dawn of rowing all over the U.S. Uh, th thank you very much for joining us, Stephen. Um, we have two, two uh, famous people on Boathouse Row who are color commentators for the evening. Uh, one is Sophie Sosha. Uh, Sophie is the president of the Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club and a vice president of the Pennsylvania Barge Club. Uh, Sophie has been a beloved and well-respected leadership figure in the Philadelphia rowing community for many decades. Uh, last fall, uh, Sophie was inducted into the U.S. Rowing Hall of Fame as an athlete for her participation in the famous Vichy Eight, which was the first American women's crew to compete internationally. Um, we are also honored this evening uh, to, to, to welcome uh, Ernestine Bear Jr. Uh, to our story hour. Uh, Ernie is, of course, a member of the Bear family, which might be the closest thing in American rowing that we have to royalty. <laughs> so her father, Ernest, was an Olympic champion with the Pennsylvania Barge Club and had held leadership positions with the NAAO and the Schuylkill Navy for many, many decades. Uh, uh, her father has been inducted twice into the U.S. Rowing Hall of Fame, once as an athlete and also as a coach for his coaching of the VCA. A. Ernie's mother, also Ernestine, was one of the original founders of PGRC. She was an early perennial champion in women's rowing, the first woman inducted into the USRA Hall. She, uh, Ernie herself was a member of the great first generation of elite international women rowers. 
and she was inducted into the hall last fall as a member of the, of the BCA. Ernie literally grew up at the Pennsylvania Barge Club and PGRC, has a unique perspective about early rowing in general, about women's rowing in particular, from her lifelong experiences in the Philadelphia rowing community. So thank you very much for joining us, Ernie and Sophie. So, so um, uh, Lily, are, can you, are you ready to take it away? Great, sure, thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank you, Dottie. I'm gonna share my screen and hope the technology works. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Wonderful. Um, well, good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here and to, and to, join, uh, uh, to join you all this evening to talk about the history of rowing. And uh, I'm gonna take us back into uh, the mists of time. Um, there's some evidence that the hill that we call Fairmount today may have been a ceremonial site uh, for the Lenny Lenape people. Uh, and I want us all to remember that we are talking about the traditional lands of the Lenny Lenape tonight, um, specifically the area around Fairmount, which I'm showing you uh, in a map from 1752. And there's a blow up. So you can see where, we, uh, where we're sort of focusing on with Boathouse Row today uh, and how it changed uh, over the, uh, the century or so after this map was, uh, was published. Um, and um, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm, okay, let's try again. There we go. So um, people have been rowing on the Schuylkill since forever. Uh, when Europeans first settled around what is now Philadelphia, uh, you had to row on the Schuylkill because it was the only way to get across the river. There were no bridges at that point. Uh, and this is a print from 1789 that shows us some uh, pretty fashionable ladies being rowed across the river. Uh, it was just like the Thames in London. You would hire someone who was called a waterman uh, to row you across the river uh, and pay, uh, uh, you know, essentially it's a water taxi. Um, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that sometimes if the waterman wasn't available, his wife or his daughter could have rowed you across. Uh, we don't have any evidence of that, but that certainly uh, there is some evidence uh, that that was happening on the Thames in London, uh, and it may have been happening on the Schuylkill as well. Um, this print is really interesting, uh, not only for showing us uh, people rowing across the Schuylkill in 1789, um, but uh, also because it was published in the same year as another print, maybe both of them by a man named Charles Wilson Peel, who was a famous artist at that time. And when I first looked at these prints, I thought, gee, that's kind of interesting. Um, I think they actually fit together, uh, which they do if you adjust them a bit. Um, Bush Hill, uh, which is on the right side, uh, you can see in this print, uh, was located where the Community College of Philadelphia is right now. Uh, and uh, the house in the, uh, the left side of the right-hand print is called Springettsbury, and it was roughly located uh, uh, right around um, Fairmount uh, and, and uh, the end of Fairmount Avenue. So what we're looking at in these two prints combined is roughly the general area of where Boathouse Row is today. Uh, Mr. Peel was not known for his topographical accuracy, so it's really kind of an estimation. Uh, but it gives us a sense of what the Schuylkill looked like uh, roughly around 1789. Um, by the turn of the 19th century, the Schuylkill was probably uh, the uh, young Republic of the United States' uh, most famous river, even more famous than, than the Hudson at this time, as uh, a beautiful and picturesque river. It was memorialized by poets like Thomas Moore. And one of the reasons it was so famous as a picturesque river was because of the high style estate and these uh, the villa houses or mansions as we call them uh, that lined the river by the turn of the 19th century. And we're looking at Sweetbriar uh, in a painting from 1811. And Sweetbriar of course um, still stands along the, the banks of the Schuylkill. Uh, and you can see in this, uh, in this painting by Thomas Birch just um, how wonderful the river was uh, at, uh, at this time. And also Sandy can tell you that uh, uh, the island off to the right is probably where they would have taken advantage of uh, building some of the uh, uh, the uh, canals for the 
canal system or the, uh, the locks for the canal system. So Schuylkill is very famous. It's very well known. There are a lot of uh, artists who are making images of the Schuylkill uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, here are two examples. Um, and of course, as Adam is going to tell us um, um, a little later on, the waterworks uh, are built at the base of Fairmount in the second decade of the 19th century and designed to kind of complement and fit in the architectural style of the surrounding villas. Uh, if you look really, really closely in the painting on the left, you can see Lemon Hill off in the distance uh, with the waterworks in the foreground. And the hill called Fairmount, they took the top off, turned it into a reservoir. Um, what's important is because the city had taken, uh, uh, had uh, acquired uh, uh, ownership of Fairmount at this point in order to build the waterworks, it becomes public land. And so it's accessible to tourists and the waterworks becomes a very important uh, tourist uh, attraction because you can climb up the top of uh, Fairmount to the reservoirs and see the panorama of the river stretching out uh, ahead of you. At this time in the 1820s, still not, uh, not highly developed. There isn't a lot of industry on the river. And of course, Sandy's gonna tell us um, how the, uh, the navigation system changed that. Uh, you can see that this view is still popular in the 1840s, uh, kind of variation on this panorama looking up the river. If you look really closely uh, in the middle distance uh, of the John Casper Wild lithograph, uh, you can see, uh, um, I think it's a four uh, um, taking off from, uh, from one of the, uh, um, the wharves or the docks there along the river. So already by 1840, uh, competitive rowing is happening because of course the dam had uh, dammed the Schuylkill. The Schuylkill was a tidal river up to East Falls and, and a pretty uh, difficult river to navigate until it was dammed and this lake was, uh, was formed uh, which made competitive rowing that much easier uh, in um, uh, north of the dam. Uh, and of course, uh, already in the 1830s, competitive regattas uh, are taking place along the river. Um, here a wonderful painting by uh, an Italian visitor named Nicolino Caglio. Uh, I'm not sure what that house is on the right. It might be Fountain Green, uh, but the house in the background on the left, uh, it was known as Egglesfield or Eaglesfield. Uh, and that's roughly where Girard Avenue is now to give you a sense of, I think, where we're located uh, uh, in this, uh, this wonderful view of uh, an early regatta on the river. Maybe the first one, I think Dottie, you thought it was, uh, may have been the first competitive regatta uh, at this time. Yeah, I think it was the largest. There was a, one a couple years before with a fewer boats, but um, there's a lot of uh, history that was written, several books uh, that indicate this was the uh, race with the six eight oared boats and note the uniforms because they were crazy about the colors and the uniforms. So, yeah. so you could identify your, your, your crew from a distance by, by the color of their uniforms. Right, right. Um, so um, the next slide is just to show you how the panoramic view has changed dramatically by the 1860s. Uh, again, if you look really closely in the background on the west bank of the river, the Reading Railroad is there. There's a little train in the background. Adam's going to talk about the waterworks, the West Philadelphia waterworks that you can see on the west bank. Uh, and of course, the hotels and small factories that are lining the west bank of the river uh, by 1867. Uh, steamboats, that was one of the ways to get up the river still. Uh, if you wanted to travel up to Laurel Hill or, uh, or East Falls, you could take a steamboat. Uh, and we can see here some of the, uh, the early temporary boathouses erected by, uh, by the Schuylkill Navy along the east bank of the Schuylkill. Uh, and circled in red there is the first permanent uh, boathouse building, which was actually built as the a skating club. It's part of a planned re-landscaping of the Lemon Hill section of what by now was known as Fairmount Park. And Fairmount Park would get larger and larger over the course of the 1860s. Uh, and into the 1870s. Um, but that of course is the, uh, is the uh, skating club circled in red and there you can see it on the, uh, the plan that was developed by these two landscape architects uh, for the city to sort of re-landscape Lemon Hill. We're still not sure exactly how much of this plan uh, was realized. Again, if you look closely, uh, it was supposed to include uh, the zoo and a horticultural center, uh, which uh, 
uh, were not uh, were not realized at that time. So it, uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly how much of this plan uh, was implemented. Um, but um, certainly uh, an early view of Boathouse Row by the 1860s. Uh, and um, I could go on and talk about this for hours and hours and hours, but uh, I'm going to end with uh, a view of uh, PGR, what is now PGRC in the background, uh, and a wonderful grouping of men, women, and children in uh, roughly uh, 1865. Uh, the photographer called it Happy Days at Fairmount. And there you can see the distinctive cupola uh, of the girls club in, uh, in the background. And with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. Thank you, Lily, for uh, saying half of what I was going to say. So it'll make <laughs> what I say shorter. So, uh, uh, but, you know, a friend of mine who's a teacher says that you have to repeat things for people to absorb them. So uh, there's going to be a little bit of repetition here. Yeah, but you're um, going to refine it. I guess so. Uh, <laughs> with help, you know, if, if I'm not refining it enough, I uh, will, will, people will let me know. Okay, we weren't supposed to start with that one, but um, so we'll back it up. Start with this one. Um, so before before the I'm gonna t I'm I'm the one of the things I am is the historian for the Philadelphia Water Department, and um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of the uh, the use uses of the Schuylkill River and for as a water supply and. Before there was the Fairmount Waterworks, there was there was this was one of two pumping stations that was part of the original waterworks of the city, which was uh, created, opened, first started delivering water through its through its system of wooden wooden distribution pipes initially, uh, in 1801, and operated until about 1815. Um, the uh, Center Square Works had two pumping stations. Both of them operated with steam engines. They were designed, the system was designed by Benjamin Latrobe, who, uh, who uh, is better known as the architect of part of the US Capitol and, and, and other projects. And it was a response to yellow fever, uh, which ravaged Philadelphia in the 1790s. The worst of the epidemics killed 5,000 out of 50,000 or so residents at the time in 1793. So the city was looking for any way to, to reduce the effects of that disease. And they figured uh, by cleaning the city, by having a fresh water supply, they would be able to do that. They, ch they chose the Schuylkill River because it was the cleaner river. The Delaware River was the port. It was the city had developed along the Delaware River and, um, and, and, uh, Therefore, they chose the Schuylkill, which, you know, if you you can read stories about Benjamin Franklin swimming in the Schuylkill and other people swimming in the Schuylkill. I mean, even when the Schuylkill got very polluted, kids kids will always swim in a river uh, in their neighborhood, no matter no matter uh, how polluted or, or whatever. But it was very, very, very much very clean in, in the early, early 18th century. Just to the the person who's uh, organizing this, is there any way for me to not hear every time someone is admitted into the room? Um, I can ignore it, but I'd rather not. Um, but that's only because oh, you're a host as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so this is two views of the of the Fairmount Waterworks, which is the second waterworks. The problem with the Center Square Works was that there were two steam engines, and if one of them broke down, the whole system stopped. Uh, if we go back to this slide, uh, the the storage, the reservoir for this system was in the in the in the top of this building, and it only held about a 24 hours worth of supply. And and uh, so, if if the engines broke and the the the, water, the tanks ran out, then there was no there was no water, and people would have to resort to uh, the the wells that that this system replaced, which were polluted by the privies, which were uh, basically side by side in the backyards of many houses. There was a privy on one side and a well on the other, both of them uh, draining, drawing the, the well drawing water from the same gravel strata that the, the privies were emptying their, draining their waste into. So it was not a very healthy system. Uh, so this, as, as Lily said, I could talk for an hour just about this picture or just the next few. And I have a whole bunch I wanna show you. 
So th because of the problems with the steam engines, they were they were burning wood, which was very expensive. There was no coal at that point early in the early in the 19th century. The city decided to move the waterworks to Fairmount, which Lily has all, already described. You can see the mount behind the building on the left. That's the engine house, and there is they they put steam engines in that building as well. They had the same problems with the steam engines uh, at Fairmount. Uh, explosions in the boilers, killing people, uh, just the the general inefficiency of it, the expense of the wood. So they decided in working in conjunction with the Schuylkill Navigation to build the little adjunct to the original engine house you can see in the picture on the left, uh, which is the mill house, which housed some water wheels. And that here you can see the completed mill house. This is probably from about 1840, uh, hand colored, probably hand colored in 1940. But um, uh, in any case, here's you can see the edge of the dam, the mill house with the water wheels, and then the old engine house, which became a saloon at some point. And then the wooden bridge, the Wernwag Bridge that once crossed the uh, the Schuylkill River, where the Spring Garden Street Bridge is now, until that bridge burned in the 1830s. Um, and you can also see here a depiction of the canal uh, uh, on the on the right. This is, I think, below the locks, but Sandy will tell us all about that. So here's a here's an isometric view done by Frederick Graff Jr. Frederick Graff was his father who designed these works and. He was an assistant to Benjamin Latrobe on the center square work. So he designed the Fairmount works and his son uh, became the chief engineer after his death in, in the in the 1840s, late 1840s. So you can see the reservoirs, which are 92 feet above above the river. Uh, so we have 90, a 92 foot fall of water, which which enabled these reservoirs to serve the entire city uh, by gravity. Um, the the uh, dam, which which I'll show, we've seen pictures of already, backed up uh, six mile six mile lake, uh, which was known by the city as the Fairmount Pool, um, and also the you can see how the the system worked. The dam backed up the water, and the water came where the four bay is, and underneath a bridge. Uh, into the mill race, and then it fell through the building and powered the water wheels as it was going down into the river below the dam. But the, da the dam afforded about a nine foot drop, which gave enough power to then run pumps to pump the water up into the reservoir. So basically they were using the power of the river, the power of the water in the river, the, the river water itself to uh, to pump the water. So it saved a lot of money in, in fuel costs and it was much more reliable. Um, and if you've ever wondered where those reservoirs sat in relation to the art museum, this drawing was done in the 1970s when a historical a historic American building survey team surveyed the Fairmount Waterworks in, in, in photographs and drawings. Um, and so it sort of sat sideways across where the art museum sits. It would have covered up the, where the Rocky statue is at the bottom of the steps and, and all, all basically covered the entire the the entire footprint almost, and then some of the art museum. Um, so here's an early, very early picture of the boathouses. Uh, this is this is about about 1860. This is from the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. You can see Lemon Hill. There, you know, there's obviously boathouses here, but nothing like nothing like we. We've seen today, so I don't know if anybody uh, in the you know the historical people here who who might know might be able to date this picture better, but I'd be curious uh, either now or in the chat or however you want to communicate that how old this might be. It, so. I, I suspect it's it's like you say pre eighteen sixty one, Adam, because I don't see the skating club yet. No, it's just a. Although the skating club started in 1849, so I think that probably is their building there, maybe. That temporary building, yeah. Yeah. So um, so this, of course, is what the waterworks looks like today in relation to the relation to the uh, the art museum. And 
uh, if you think of the high, the reservoirs, the reservoirs were about as high up as the roof of the art museum. We had a good photographer who took a lined up some old pictures, the new pictures, and that's what the pictures show that the reservoir was as high as the roofs of the reservoir, the roofs of the art museum. So they they really did a lot of cutting down of the of the reservoirs and of the hill to to get the art museum in, and they probably cut down the hill as Lily suggested just to build the reservoirs. So. So, um, uh, so, and, and I meant to start a timer on myself. So someone tell me if I'm talking too much, but um, uh, the, the Fairmount was not the only, the only waterworks uh, built in, fill in along the Schuylkill River in the vicinity of Boathouse Row as there were, Three different, the Fairmount is down here on the right. Those are the basins. This is from the 1867 uh, Farms and Lots map showing the creation of Fairmount Park, all the properties that were bought up to create the park. Um, uh, and on the left is the West Philadelphia Waterworks uh, in the purple, and then uh, above is the Spring Garden Waterworks. I'm just going to show you a few pictures of each of these. This is, is the West Philadelphia Waterworks, which was from 1855. It operated till 1870 when the Belmont pumping station was built. That's the building that still stands uh, farther upstream. This was about in the middle of the zoo, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, these are some pictures of it. It was designed by a man like, but named Henry P.M. Birkenbein and his partner, Mr. Trotter, who we don't know what his first name was. Uh, and it involved pumping water uh, using steam, steam engines, and by this time using coal to burning coal to create the steam and run the pumps to, up to the stamp pipe, that which, which was up above, and then also uh, into a reservoir on George's Hill above the, where the Man Music Center is now. Um, just another view of the building and the smokestack. Uh, and Here's a 1875 diagram of the zoo. Probably, I think that was just about when the zoo was created. And you can see that Blue Arrow points at the forebay, which is where the water was pumped from uh, for the waterworks, for this West Philadelphia waterworks. And here's a Google view. And, and so if you overlay the two of these, then it looks like the waterworks sat somewhere near Lemur, what's now called, Google at least calls Lemur Island in the in the uh, in the in the zoo um of course the zoo wasn't there yet um adam a couple more minutes okay uh yeah, yeah that's fine um spring garden pumping station again was built in uh, starting in 1845 and then greatly expanded over the years went out of service in 1909 the same year fairmount went out of service here's a picture of that building that's a should be a familiar view to everybody uh, and that that sat in what now is the Glendenning Rock Garden. Uh, the forebay of that uh, of that building was in the Glendenning Rock Garden, um, and then all the buildings were all around that. So, as, as Lily pointed out, there were steamboats that that plied on the Schuylkill. This is 1824, and you can see Lemon Hill above the Fairmount Waterworks on the right. This steamboat heading for the locks. There were also uh, steamboats that that didn't have to use the locks that just sort of parked themselves at the wharf at Fairmount. And um, and this is one called the General Hooker. Skating on the Schuylkill also, uh, the skating club was not there for no reason. The river actually froze over. Um, here are some people riding a bicycle on the river, which it's, it's hard enough to, in my view, to ride one of those things on, this, on a solid pavement. But um, I guess once you got the hang of it, like anything, the skating club was mentioned. Um, this was from a 1925 article, says that they saved 800 to 900 lives. Uh, and here's the a, a engraving or a picture, some kind of a picture of one of those rescues that they that they undertook. So, uh, and Sandy will talk more about the, the the navigation, but the the creating of the dam not only allowed the uh, allowed the, the the rowing to happen by creating a smooth lake, there were the rowing to happen more more uh, more easily. 
but it also be, be, by being part of the Schuylkill navigation allowed it a huge huge amount of industry to uh, to start being built upstream of 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 these various waterworks that I just described, including the the borough of Maniunk, which which was the, the Either the Birmingham or the Manchester of of America in the by the 1830s or 1840s, a huge amount of fa factories, huge amount of pollution going into the river. Fairmount Park was created to 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 protect the water supply, but it really didn't manage to do that because it didn't encompass Maniunk. It it didn't keep sewage pollution out, and so this is a this is a bar graph I can talk for an hour about, and I do have an hour long talk about this one about the filtration of the water supply. But you can see here, we were asked to sort of end about 1860. 1860 is the first year the Board of Health started keeping track of typhoid fever, which was uh, created, which was caused by B. coli or E. coli bacteria getting into the water supply. And uh, you can see that it's just starting to be a problem. And, uh, you know, 27,000 people died of this one disease over the course of uh, the 50 year 50 years that followed the Civil War until so, we started filtering and chlorinating the water. Adam, we're um, going, this talk goes up to about 1860. So you think we can stop here? No, I'm, I'm, that's my last slide. That's, that's why great. I'm stopping. Maybe we can come back at the end with a show the rest no, of your slides. We, we don't have, no, there's no more slides. That's it. Oh, thank you so much. Is Sandy up next? Sandy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops, put the wrong thing, share. Okay, did I unmute myself? I did, I think. You're all set, Sandy, you look good. Okay, uh, great, hi, thanks. Oh, I'm learning stuff. Ah, um, and I have questions for you guys too, which I put on this slide, a couple of them. Uh, and I want to say hi to any bachelors, well, to everyone, but any bachelors and, and former bachelors. I, I've seen a few of you on there, so it's it's nice to see you again. Um, I have sadly moved to uh, Rhode Island, where I am still rowing my tubby open water shell on Narragansett Bay, and that is a safe boat for for rowing on the ocean. So, but I did, you may have, you may have seen me tubbly rowing it on the Schuylkill Hill uh, for about eight years. Um, so I'm gonna uh, present just some early effects that the Schuylkill navigation system would have had on rowing in Boathouse Row. Um, so the dam, of course, um, but the dam would have been built by the city regardless of whether the, the private Schuylkill navigation company um, had been involved in that, but that was that was a uh, a, a, a partnership of sorts um, that became um, a little more um, uh, <clears throat> a little more animosity to it later uh, regarding how much water each entity could draw down from the pool, and and I wonder whether the rowing community we protest now about uh, siltation in the pool, but I wonder if that started right at the very beginning with um, say in a dry summer, the canal taking water and the waterworks taking water. Um, sometimes there wasn't even a waterfall over the dam, if you can imagine that. Uh, and then I'm wondering if anyone's ever heard of the canal boats that were getting in the way. I never thought about that until I was putting this together because um, I, I just had not run across that uh, in the literature. And then the final issue being um, the waste from coal breaking and washing up in Schuylkill, Schuylkill County, making its way down the river and clogging the entire river, especially because the navigation had built 32 dams. Um, and so from the beginning, almost uh, 1820s, uh, dredging had to start to clear some of the canals and, and other channels. So where are we? This is 1827. Um, you'll notice this map says number 108 on it. This is from a map book that's in the uh, state archives that has 108 pages watercolor. I believe it's the, the only copy. So the Fairmount Waterworks um, supported getting it scanned because um, you can see it's in uh, risky condition there. Um, you can see the Fairmount Dam 
that was built 1821. You can see the, the Fairmount Waterworks. It just says W Works uh, over there. And then um, you follow that red line. That's the towpath for the navigation system on its very last mile, its 108th mile um, to get to tidewater below the Fairmount Dam. Uh, so there, there actually weren't locks between Maniunk and Maniunk and here. Uh, they used the Fairmount Pool all the way. And so that red line comes from the other side of the uh, towpath bridge um, in Maniunk, the, the outlet lock at Lock Street and crosses over there and then comes down um, the west side. And you can see that there are two sets of locks, uh, guard lock and then two chamber lock at the bottom. And these would change over time. Um, Adam had wondered where that one, one um, watercolor that he showed um, or engraving, color engraving. And it looked like that boat was between those two locks. So the, the system, um, most of us have probably seen Maniunk Canal that it still has water in it. It's a two mile stretch, but as I say, 108 miles going all the way up um, to, the, to the head of the watershed above Pottsville is where the navigation began. And this is a um, profile of it. This was done a bit later. Um, Portions of the navigation opened very early on. Uh, construction started 1816. Um, Flat Rock Dam was the first. Uh, Plymouth and Flat Rock were very early there, 1818, 1819, and then and then Fairmount, 1821. Um, here you can see again we're down at the bottom and how very steep it is up in Schuylkill County on the left side of this profile. Canals are the yellow portions and pools behind dams are the black portion. So we're that last black portion down at the bottom. And just to zoom in there so you can actually read it a little bit. Um, today we have only four of those 32 navigation dams remaining. They all have fishways over them so that the shad and, and other anadromous fishes can get upstream. Um, Fairmount does not have a number on this, on this uh, Profile. They, they have all the dams numbered, but not Fairmount, and that's because the city owned it, not the Schuylkill Navigation Company. Hmm. Sometimes it doesn't go. Why? Okay. Um, 1820, this is a drawing by Frederick Graff, who designed the Fairmount Waterworks, also designed the locks uh, on the other side of the river. And just notice this um, pattern of the stones on the um, plan view at the bottom, looking down onto the lock, uh, one of the lock chambers. And just notice that stone pattern because we'll see it again later. Uh, we can see it today. Maybe different stones, but similar pattern. So a, a lock is just a, a chamber, a, a, a stone box that holds water and um, boats go can change levels of the canal to get around dams or around um, um, slopes in topography. And I think none of it, we didn't duplicate any of our pictures, but I do have a Kaleo. Um, so there's, there's the canal on the left. Um, I think this one might be even earlier than, than the gallery had dated it because we see these boats being pulled, not Pulled, although maybe that's maybe that's a mule or a horse on the left. But um, in any case, um, no no boathouses visible in this picture. And this is looking downstream. Um, and I was, I was trying to date it by the fact that there's no standpipe uh, over at, at the Fairmount Waterworks, but an artist could have left that out. But um, I, I would say before 1859 on this one. And this may come from the same era as the one that Adam was asking about. I think we just have the frame boathouses there um, and then uh, Lemon Hill. Um, but we're looking up at the outlet lock coming down to tide water. It looks like low tide. You can see the rocks down there. I don't know if uh, 
uh, all rowers ever get down below the dam and take a look at, at um, how difficult it would be to row there uh, without a dam. So um, certainly the, the um, river was, was not particularly navigable before this system was built. And um, it tamed the river, a series of canals and slackwater pools, um, and became um, one of the, the great coal carrying canals. Um, in fact, the first of the anthracite carrying canals um, in America. Uh, you can see in the foreground, that's, that's a boat with barrels on it. Maybe they're taking some whiskey upriver or other things in barrels. Um, and this is one of the questions I had about these boats, which is some of them are really big. After 1846, when the entire system was enlarged, um, the locks were 110 feet long by 18 feet wide, and the boats uh, just about filled the locks. So this, is, this looks like one of those 100-foot boats that could carry, um, uh, and I'm forgetting the number, I think it's 180 tons of coal. Um, and this is uh, going back upriver, so it doesn't, it, it's riding high. Um, but uh, look at the size of that. And then um, how, I don't know why this doesn't always go. There, no, there. Um, and this is uh, up in Schuylkill Haven in Schuylkill County, but it's an example of how busy and crowded some of these places were. Now, there's not a lot of photography of some of the busiest years because um, um, a lot happened before photography. Um, but they, the canal wa was going strong in the six, 1860s and then um, on into the uh, end of the 19th century and even some activity into the 20th century. Uh, but can you imagine this on the Fairmount Pool waiting to get through the Fairmount Locks? I, I just, I have no image of it. I have, have not run across an, um, an account of people, com rowers complaining about it or, or, or canal, canal uh, captains complaining about rowers. So um, I just wondered if anybody else had. This is uh, the first mile up there and um, we're in Schuylkill County above Pottsville. And if you look closely, you can see that in the river, it says Manny Yunk with an I, um, which apparently was a Lenny Lenape word for river. Um, and, but it also says Schuylkill. So both are in there, 1827. The entire system was completed 1828, but as I mentioned, it's, there was portions of it in full, full swing before that. But um, this was a particularly busy uh, dock um, until it got all silted in and they had to move the head of navigation farther down river. Um, but this is uh, this is upriver of Pottsville by a couple of miles. I was just there a couple of weeks ago with touring some people around and we saw the um, we saw the ruins of this of this uh, depot, which is called Firth Docks. And railroads are bringing, you see the trains, the railroads are bringing coal directly from mines to dump it into these boats to come down to Philadelphia. Um, and this is uh, the coal breaker where coal would be broken into small enough pieces to be useful. And um, it's anthracite, it's very hard and um, was very much in demand, huge markets created um, thanks to the navigation. And um, this was getting into the river there. Sandy, this is your two minute yeah. warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, almost done. Yeah, this is, uh, and this is what happens further down. This is um, in uh, Bridgeport. It was called the Norristown Canal, um, but it's actually on the Bridgeport side. And this was considered one of the most polluted um, portions of the entire system. And just uh, going back to Boathouse Row, this is 20th century, but um, this is the, the art museum under construction and um, there's a detail of a larger photograph just so you can see the canal on the left um, has some boats in it. Uh, there was commercial traffic um, ceased at one point, there could still be some pleasure boats going through, uh, but this is pretty much the end of it, um, getting there anyway. 
You can see that coal silt, the calm from the washing and breaking process down here started to clog up around, I'm not starting, it's been doing it for a hundred years already um, by the time this was photographed. So you can see where Silt Island is going to be um, uh, in front of the boathouses. And there it is in the banks up in Schuylkill County. There's that that's black layer of where there was a washery. Um, and you see that all along the banks up there. Um, there's quite a bit of, of excellent remains um, and all, all down through um, uh, the other four counties. And when you get to Philadelphia County, we have um, the Manny Unklocks still with us, but at Fairmount, our locks were filled in 1956 um, to make room for the Schuylkill Expressway extension into the city. You can see the boathouses in the background. Say goodbye to the Fairmount locks. This is what's left down at the at Tidewater. We, we at low tide we went down um, and found some um, timbers that, that are most likely from the tail wall of the outlet lock. And then up here, the fishway, it was built on the guard lock um, right up against the dam. And you can see um, over here where my pointer is going, there's, uh, there's that stone pattern that was in that 1820 drawing. That's part of the guard lock. And in another direction here, you can see the stone again, and, and this is where we are. So that is it, thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, now we're gonna turn it over uh, to Stephen Malbuff from the Detroit Boat Club. And Stephen is going to talk about uh, some early Midwestern uh, uh, rowing in the, in the Detroit area, but also around the country as well. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. All right, so yeah, my name is Stephen Malbuff. I'm the historian with the Detroit Boat Club crew. And um, the Detroit Boat Club, as uh, Chris said, is the second oldest rowing club in the United States even though many members of our club like to claim we're the oldest and even U.S. rowing credits us as being the first rowing club organized in the United States, which is far from true. Um, but the rowing in Detroit began around eight, began in the summer of 1838 when this guy, uh, Edmund Brush, who was from Detroit, um, took a trip to New York City and he purchased a 26-foot forward rowing vessel and had it shipped back to Detroit and him and three other men uh, began rowing it that year. And then the following February, uh, they were joined by an additional four guys and they organized the Detroit Boat Club on February 18th, 1839. Um, the original club had 21 members. Detroit at this time was only around 9,000 people. And that population, the population had doubled in that lap, in the lap doubled in five years. So five years before it was half what it was in 1839. And it shows that with the makeup of the club where only five of the 21 original members were from the Detroit area and the other remainder came from the East Coast or Ireland and immigrated to Detroit in the 1830s. Um, and so this is this photograph or images of the Detroit River in, from Canada in 1837. And I have called out where the founding took place in Edmund Brush's office and then where about where the first EBC boathouse was located. Uh, this is the first rowing club on the Great Lakes region and as far as we know the first rowing club organized in the Midwest. Um, but in my research of the boat club I've been finding other rowing clubs in the United States from this period and so this is the list that I currently have that I'm continually continuing to add to of other, where rowing was happening in the United States, and particularly starting along the Northeast in New York City, and then spread from there. Many of the clubs in the Southeast, uh, particularly in New Orleans, they purchased boats from the New York clubs 
and often their clubs would share the names of whatever boat they purchased from New York. Uh, and the Detroit Boat Club, our first boat was built by a guy named William Crolius, who built many, who was the boat builder for the Castle Garden Boat Clubs of New York City. And his boats would have been the ones that passed throughout the country. Um, but as you can see, there's well over 150 rowing clubs here that don't really get talked about so much. And most rowing history really covers Philadelphia, New York, or Boston, but you don't really hear about what's going on outside of that. Um, and on this list, only two clubs are still in existence, and that's the Detroit Boat Club and Narragansett Boat Club in Providence, Rhode Island, which is 11 months older than the DBC. Um, Detroit in 1830, so this is how big Detroit is today. It's 139 square miles. You can fit all of Boston, Manhattan, and San Francisco within its borders. Um, and the gray box at the bottom, that's how big the city limits were in 1839, but most people live in the bottom third of it. And the boat club, first boathouse is right at the center, about where the Renaissance Center stands in Detroit today, if you're familiar with that. The Detroit River is about a half mile wide to a mile wide, depending on where it is in this general area. Um, and the Boat Club originally was more of a social rowing club. They did, there's a documented race in 1842 between two club boats. But other than that, they're mostly rowing for general exercise or taking guests out for excursions on the river. And many of the recollections that were passed down from the written histories was more talking about um, who mixed the strongest drinks at their parties and that sort of, and the ludicrous events that they had gotten themselves into. Um, and then in the mid 1840s, there was another rowing club made of younger men in the city that centered around a 12 oared barge that uh, named Eliza that they'd row on the river. But in 1848, there was a large fire that wiped out around 300 buildings in Detroit along the riverfront, including the boathouse. And from that fire, either one or two boats were saved, depending on what you look at when they're, they're pushed out into the river during the fire. And after that point, um, rowing ceased to exist in Detroit for eight years. The club sort of disbanded as the founders, most of the founders had moved away or were or helping out and rebuilding that portion of the city. And in the, in the United States in general, rowing was kind of in a lull at that point. The Castle Garden Clubs in New York had disbanded in the early 1840s. And there wasn't much going on necessarily other than but it started building up again towards the uh, latter after the 1840s, 1850s. This is a painting that's in the Boat Club's collection that was painted by Edmund Brush in the 1850s, 1870s. And in 1856, a group of men came together to form a rowing club in Detroit and they decided to reorganize the Detroit Boat Club and all the original members were put on an honorary list with the original members um, varied on how involved they were in rowing, but several of them were, were very involved, including the founder, Edmund Brush. And he donated the second boat that he purchased for the boat club that had been saved from the fire. And that became the first boat of the reorganized club. And he painted, he actually painted this painting of it. Um, and so there's rechristened the Edmonds in his honor and used to hang in the old boathouse. Um, and so rowing in the 1850, 18, 1860, the next rowing club joins the DVC on the river. And just before the Civil War, rowing is starting to grow in the Great Lakes region with um, another several boat clubs in the process of forming in 1861. And there's even talks of a Great Lakes Rowing Association to foster rowing in the region. But the Civil War soon put a stop to that for, for the meantime. Um, up in the upper left, I believe that may be a photo of our sec of the second Detroit Boat Club boathouse. It, in either way, it's from prior to 1866, so it could be either one of two clubs or a private boathouse. But there's a series of photos of the sculler going back and forth in the canal here. You can see him rowing by. Um, in 1858, they built this larger boathouse a block away, and um, it would be expanded many times over the years. And at the bottom here, you have a couple of the crews from the 1850s, 1860s. And the one that's really interesting is this one that has these um, young ladies rowing here from 1869. And in the, so as just after the Civil War, 
um, rowing really began the surge in Detroit. And there's other clubs forming in 1867, the Detroit River Navy was organized similar to the Schuylkill Navy. And in the 1870s, they said that it, would, it was the largest rowing organization in the United States made up of clubs from just one city. Um, but one of their main things is they'd have reviews where the different boats would sort of perform these choreographed movements on the river. And there were actually several small clubs of young ladies between the ages of eight and 14 about that were encouraged to join in on these. And Detroit was actually very proud that they were the only one of the only cities or the only city that they knew of that had women rowing. Um, but they uh, at that time, and this is the only known picture of it, one of the earliest known photos of women, of anyone rowing in Detroit. Hey, Stephen, do you know how many clubs there were when you got the title of having the most clubs? And well, this is from, from 1877, there are around 20 or so, but they're saying in terms of numbers of oarsmen as well, they said there's over a thousand rowers in Detroit at that time, which I don't know if that's true or not, but um, I'm still, researching into that claim a bit more, but uh, I'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, I, think, I, I think a lot of people are going to be uh, asking some uh, questions during our Q&A coming up, and I was wondering if it would be possible to maybe scroll through a little bit more quickly so we can yeah. have time for the Q&A. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so this is the rowing clubs in eight, the 1860s forming up along the Eastern Riverfront. Um, among them, this is the Excelsior Boat Club, which is one of the more competitive rowing clubs in the city at that time. And then it forced the Detroit Boat Club to build a much larger boathouse, which they would say is one of the largest in the country at that time. Um, and a boathouse district, in a way similar to Boathouse Row, began the form of these larger boathouses. And the, the boathouse district stretched for several blocks, included so within it 15 to 18 boat clubs, boat builders everything, grandstands, everything needed the host or regatta was along the shores here. Um, and then the Midwest, one of the more popular events was the 10 ord barge races, which seems to be mostly a Midwestern thing. Um, and those remained popular for the 1800s. And then this is another club, the Centennial Boat Club, which was organized in 1875. Um, in 1877, Detroit became host of the fifth national championships because after the first four were held in the East, the National Association of Amateur Oarsmen was wondering why, um, why no East or Western clubs are coming to the nationals. And so there's a several very pointed letters from a Chicago oarsman talking about how disgruntled he was with the Eastern rowing clubs and how they never really gave the Western clubs the time of day when cities like Detroit had all these clubs and the amount of support that they would have in rowing. Um, and so that this regatta, it was said that over 50,000 people came to watch the rowing races. And in, at this time, rowing was so popular in Detroit, they were attracted about a quarter to half the city's population to come watch races. Um, in Michigan as well, the four orange shells started making Michigan more well-known in rowing, particularly the Showaza Met of Monroe and the Hillsdales of Hillsdale, Michigan. A uh, Michigan Cruz won the senior four oared shells for, at the nationals, five out of six national championships between 1877 and 1882. And the Showaza Met was one of the first American clubs to go represent the United States at the Henley Royal Regatta in England. Uh, and then what made rowing so popular in Detroit was that there's a lack of parks. And so more people were able to go row, uh, more people live near the riverfront. And so that helped expand rowing. But by the 1880s, the riverfront became much more industrialized and unsafe. And there's less open for boat clubs to build along the riverfront. And along with that, the city got its first professional baseball team in 1881. <laughs> Detroit River Navy listing that as being one of the reasons why they um, couldn't uh, host the regatta that year. Uh, so gradually, um, a high point of clubs are actually over 25 clubs, 1879, and they're down to two by eight. So in the 1870s, somebody needs to mute. Sorry. Oh. 
Um, and so the number of clubs steadily dwindled and the remaining clubs moved further upriver with the Detroit Bow Club moving to Belle Isle where it currently is today. And there've been over 50 different rowing clubs in Detroit during that time. And so then once they moved to Belle Isle, their boathouses continued to expand until we got our current one in 1902. And that's what I got. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you. you. That's great. The houses are huge in Detroit. <laughs> yeah, and that's what's interesting is in my boathouse research, like Chris said, so for my master's thesis, I was creating a proposal for our boathouse because it's in a fairly rundown state today. But um, I was researching other rowing clubs in the United States, and I visited over 30 boathouses about a year and a half ago. And in my research, there is no other rowing club like the Detroit Boat Club in the sense where like the boat houses on the Schuylkill where you have the boat bays on the first floor and then you have a social room upstairs. The, our boat house is essentially a very much expanded version of that versus other clubs of a similar size, such as the New York Athletic Club. They have several different buildings for each thing versus having it all under one roof like the Detroit Boat Club did, and which creates a lot of different uh, struggles with using the building. <laughs> Stephen, one of the most fascinating things I saw in the photos is you, there's a couple of pictures of uh, training singles that look like modern day boats. They, mm -hmm. did, did you notice that in the, they, they, and, and you, you, you mentioned that, oh, that one, the one the, right there, oh, next previous, right there. Uh, you see the one in the upper left corner? Mm -hmm. That looks like a modern day training single. And, and I, I'm just wondering, I, I did not know that uh, the, the uh, boat architects from New York City, you're saying they evidently were the ones who were building boats in, in the Midwest? Well, so the first boats from the Detroit Boat Club were from New York. And then once rowing became really popular in Detroit, Detroit had its own boat builders. It had several different, different builders who would build any boat you wanted. Um, except the Detroit Boat Club was the exception where all of their boats they purchased in New York because the Detroit Boat Club was, it was the most wealthy club. It was the largest club. They had the most boats, the largest boathouse, but they weren't the fastest club on the river. There's other clubs that were much more competitive and, um, but they would spend their money to buy these boats from New York and have them shipped out to Detroit every couple of years. So like the boat on the bottom that the women are rowing is called the Mini, and it was owned by the guy who's sitting at the uh, bow of it, and he was one of the guys who reorganized the boat club in 1856, and that was one of his private boats, and as you can see, it's a three or it's a triple, Cox triple with an extra seat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Do you want to take down uh, your shared view? and we can see each other and ask uh, questions of all the panelists. There we go. People have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand, maybe Jen or one of us can see you. One of the things that you might've noticed in the picture of that four oared shell where the men were in the front was it, the body positions looked almost like modern day rowers. And the reason why is they slid back and forth, but not on seats with rollers. They actually had canvas, a canvas, um, almost like suede leather sewn to the back of the rowing pants. And they slid back and forth on the wood so that they were greased, which allowed them to reach out for the stroke or go back at the finish. But they did not have rowing seats. They did not have rollers. Yes, and the, some of the old boats that the clubs purchased in the 1850s and 60s, once they came out with sliding seats, there are articles in Detroit of um, them retrofitting the old boats to with these newer improvements as time went on. And some of these boats would last into the 1890s. They still have them around. Uh, <laughs> uh, Adam, I, I have a question for you. Um, Lily mentioned in her early comments that that the that the Schuylkill River water was fairly clean, I guess, uh, in the late 18th century. And uh, but but I'm 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 wondering um, when 
you know, after the canal and all the navigation traffic and everything, and once the pollution started, how did the water system purify its water it, at, at the art museum? It uh, let it settle. Yeah. They would pump it into the reservoir and then they called it sedimentation and the solids would float to the sink to the bottom and then they draw the water to pump in to distribute to uh, into the system. They draw it from the top. Um, that's as oversimplified, but there was no other no other treatment at that point, which is why uh, why when they built filtration in the early 20th century that they couldn't build there was no room to build it build filtrate filters at Fairmount there was just no no more room and there was no room at Spring Garden either um, and uh, so they had to abandon those plants that was how they they measured they measured water quality as Adam mentioned by by sedimentation until really the 1870s it wasn't until the uh, Pasteur and the development of microscopy and the germ theory that they actually began to identify the bacteria in the water. And mm. you read some of the reports from the water, uh, the water department in the 1850s, and they still think the water is fine, it's, you know, because the sedimentation was actually less than cities like London. Um, so it's it a lot of it was kind of in the eyes of the beholder. Yeah, that's that it's that 0.01% of water that bacteria take up that they weren't seeing. So um, and that was killing a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. So I have a question. The um, peninsula island, I don't know what you want to call it, that now has a little walkway to it. Um, what has caused that? And what is the, like the ebb and flow of that um, island? I, I don't know. Well, what well that, the, the, that kind of island would probably form behind any dam um, over time where it's not really dredged properly and and having all the coal waste that sandy was mentioning that they would wash the coal up in schuylkill county and then the the river would run black in a heavy rain it would wash all that coal waste into the river and eventually would get down to philadelphia and and uh you know the sedimentation often didn't get that fine coal waste that would float in the water and the water would come out of people's faucets black i have you know, I found dozens of cartoons talking about women trying to do wash with black water. Yeah, um, Adam, I, you could we ask Dave? Have you heard Dave? It. Yeah. Could, could, could we ask Dave to mute? I think he's could, could we ask creating. Dave to mute? I think he's creating. <laughs> oh well, um, Adam, I thought that silt, we call it silt island. And um, I had thought that it was from just piling up behind the dam. And then it may have been Len Punt who's writing a, uh, writing a, a book about the um, history of the Fairmount Waterworks. A couple of weeks ago, he said that um, it was deliberately piled there when there was dredging at some point in the, in probably when the, um, Schuylkill River Project was cleaning the river, 1950s-ish. And that's the first time I'd heard that. Um, but you know that photograph of the guys in suits standing on the big block of silt right in front of Bo Boathouse Row? <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, does that make any sense that they would have deliberately built a pile there? No, no, it, do it doesn't to me, but I, yeah. you know. Len's done a lot of research, so I'd like to see what he's found. But yeah, they, were actually, they were actually piping that silt from behind the dam. They they built an 11 mile pipeline where they used the suction dredge to such suck, suck all that stuff into this pipeline, and they used they put it down in Southwest Philadelphia where they were trying to fill land lowland near the airport to make more high ground above the above the river. I found I found references to complaints about silt already piling up. By the uh, by, the skating club as early as the 1860s. So, yeah. Um, oh yeah, oh. it was a problem. Something that people may not be aware of is that the Schuylkill was a major source of ice uh, until uh, until the river stopped freezing. Um, so I wonder, Adam, if if people got ice delivered to their homes that was also a little gray or black. Um, <laughs> they might they might have, but they also that might have also put an end to the ice business in the by the right. middle of the century. 
John Quinn seemed to have a question. Didn't have a didn't have a question or a comment. Uh, I I was around uh, uh, when they when they did the first, one of the first strategies in the early fifties, and they completely took Silt Island out uh, because. Prior to that time, you couldn't get down uh, to the bottom boathouse, uh, which was play called Playstead Hall at the time, which is where uh, the Vesper boatman uh, did his work. You couldn't get in and out of that dock. When they got done dredging, which is in the mid uh, 55, 56, something like that, uh, that island was completely gone. So what you have right now has built up since that time. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank wow. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I personally, I think it's a shame that that island was left there because it really, from the boat, if you look at old pictures from the beginning of the 20th century, old photographs sort of, there's a nice sweeping curve that led, led out to the, to the, to the gazebo out on the end of the dam. And it was a nice bulkhead and a nice concrete wall or something. And it, and by, by putting a boardwalk on it, they've just sort of taken what's basically this is my opinion, not the water departments. We've taken a piece of wasteland and 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 uh, because birds happen to live there because trees grew up on it, then they made it a little wildlife thing. It's just anyway, that's we my should opinion. make it our mission to we should we should make it our mission to eliminate that. <laughs> one, one other comment. I thought Sandy made a very, very perceptive and interesting comment in her remarks, and that is, that if you look at all of her photos regarding the Schuylkill Navigation Channel, there would have been an enormous amount of barge and boat traffic in the Schuylkill, which seems to me would have impeded rowing, uh, or at least would have contested rowing. Um, and uh, you know, as as one of the historians of one of the boathouses, I personally have never heard of that or or uh, I, have, I have no data on any of the competition between the barges and, and the rowing traffic or whatever. But uh, I, th I think that that's something we should, we should explore and find out because I, I, I just, you know, the, the, so some of those photos indicate that it, there was very heavy traffic. Of, I, think of that, I, I think it would be, uh, you know, it, it, I've looked, um, you know, Sandy raised this question. I heard her talk a couple of weeks ago and, and I went to the, newspaper databases and try to, and it's impossible to, you know, how do you search on accident? Um, but it's a really interesting point. And I think it also points to how a lot of the images from that period, you know, were edited a bit. But I wonder, is there any way, Sandy or Adam, of discovering who was in charge of overseeing navigation on the river in the 19th century? I mean, was there something like the Coast Guard and someone who was who was managing that traffic. There's, there was, there's a little book that that was a, a book was put out like a little guidebook of the river, um, telling the the canal boat captains what to look out for. It it kind of reminds me of like if you if you ever do like the Schuylkill sojourn or you kayak or canoe a little bit up in the upper reaches, um, the the maps they give you have guides for, you know, stay river left here because there's a big log, you know, things like that. And, and that was, that was what this little guidebook was for the canal boats. That's, that's all I can think of off the top of my head in terms of, I mean, there were things to keep the boats from crashing into the locks at night. Like you might've noticed on the one photograph I showed that was very dark Brown, that was around 1860 or, or a little earlier how it was whitewashed. So they whitewashed the uh, the lock surface so that it can be seen. Um, and then um, they also would have the the big conch shell that they would blow as as a horn to warn um, the lock tender to, to op you know get get the get the chamber ready for the boat coming. Um, now I don't know if that helps rowers at all. Um, okay. And you know, I, they were on the west side. You know, maybe they just hugged the west side and rowing stayed away from them. I, I but sure, well, it, you know, forget, there was. Don't, don't forget the steamboats were going up and down the river too. Yeah. Yes. Um, for bachelors, uh, when I when I talk about that uh, in the upcoming, I have a couple episodes of interaction with uh, traffic between uh, bachelors boats and. Um, uh, commercial traffic. So I'll share that with everybody. It's very oh, interesting. Good. Hi, Harry. Hi. 
one thing one thing I'm interested in, especially you know some some of the people here are old enough to remember when the Schuylkill River was very polluted, and what was it like rowing in the in the in a polluted river? Um, if if it was, I mean, maybe it wasn't as polluted as I imagined, but I know and with nobody having sewage treatment upstream, you know, there was a lot of an industry dumping waste all up and down the river, not not in the park, but everywhere else above, in, including Maniunk. Uh, what was what was uh, what what was it like? It was horrible. <laughs> it was it was it was just extremely dirty. And and it was you know, it was all the rowers regarded the water as being unsafe. Uh, toxins did not like to get thrown in the water. Uh, yeah, would, you know, ceremoniously, that's what happens after a win. You normally throw the coxswain in the water, but uh, you know, certain coxswains would run rather than be, <laughs> rather than be thrown in the water. Uh, I can remember as a you know as a, as a teenager. The things that were did were done. I mean, people used to throw cherry bombs into the into the water in order to go fishing. They would throw the cherry bombs in, explode them, and the fish would float to the surface. Whatever whatever was left of the fish was 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 not much. But yeah, it was it was really bad. I mean, you just knew that you didn't you didn't you just never tried to drink the the water. If any of the water splashed on you, you would wipe it away. And uh, yeah, it was it was bad. Um, can I just, um, in 1968 for Earth Day, um, I was I was the Westchester. Uh, uh, we had to come down to Schuylkill and take water samples and grow the water samples back in our bio lab. And I totally concur. I can remember it was unbelievable what we were growing in our petri dishes in 1968. <laughs> It was, it was unbelievable. The good, news, the good news is we now have more than 50 species of fish just in the Philadelphia portion of the Schuylkill. Wow. And there was, a, there was a time when there weren't any before, before the 1950 cleanup. So good news. <laughs> Other questions? This has been terrific, really wonderful program. Um, um, there's, there's one thing a lot of people might not know. There's actually a museum in the waterworks, which is marvelous to go to, that you take an elevator down and where you end up down on what would be, you think is the ground floor, you're actually in a holding tank where the water was. And a lot of people don't even know it's there. And it's a lovely museum that's actually in the basement of the waterworks. So now I'll cause a big flood with everybody going there. But it, it's really nice. <laughs> That's very good. And they have a very informative like movie that plays on, yes. on a loop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that movie is working right now after all the floods. Um, after Ida, I doubt it's working right now. But but yeah, they are open again. That's that's where I, I work. I work remotely mostly or or upstream. Um, but um, yeah, it's wonderful. Check it out. <laughs> There's a new exhibition going in. There's two exhibitions. One in the where the pool was, um, the new mill house <clears throat> um, that later became an aquarium, and then and then the Kelly Natatorium, the pool um, until Hurricane Agnes. Um, it had been empty after 1972, and now there are different um, art installations that go in there. So there's one called Pool. It's spectacular. Do not miss it. It just reopened. It was open last year um, about the legacy of um, of uh, public public pools um, segregation um, and uh, in Philadelphia and, and elsewhere. Um, and then there's another exhibition about flood floods, I think. Opening up. Uh, I just got the notice today. So awesome. Yeah. Christopher, or thank you. Christopher or Dottie, do you have any final thoughts? Well, we did, we'd like to thank all of our speakers. Uh, they, they, they've done an excellent job. The comments are coming in in the chats and people are, are, are just thrilled with all the presentations. And uh, so thank you very much to everyone. Uh, Stephen, I thought that yours was really enlightening from the, from the standpoint that 
you know, we get to broaden our horizons a little bit uh, around here. Uh, some, sometimes we're a little bit too, a uh, little bit too centered on, on Philadelphia. But I think what you've shown is that all the same social forces that cause recreational rowing, I mean, are there, it's the same all over the country. It's happening all over the place. And thank you very, very much for that. I can't wait to get out to Detroit to see DBC. <laughs> Absolutely. Dottie, did, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I think uh, learning about the river and the water we drink, uh, we didn't talk about the turtles, but somebody made a comment on the chat that we can't get rid of the island because the, there are turtles there that are endangered. I don't know anything about that. Maybe we'll do a program at some point about the wildlife on, on the river. But our next upcoming one, Jen, you want to tell talk about that? Sure. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean. You can you can add in here, Dottie. But um, so we'll continue. Uh, we'll, we'll, the next next one will be in mid uh, May, and uh, this will focus on. We're going to start kind of taking uh, each of the boathouses along the row and kind of telling the historical perspective, maybe through through the eyes of of a boathouse. Um, so building off of 1860s um, into the into the next century. Um, so we're going to we're going to shift our uh, focus to Bachelors uh, Barge Club, which was one of the first um, permanent structures there. Um, and uh, so everyone that has come out tonight will receive that invitation um, to to our next story hour. You'll also get a follow up email in the next couple of days, and I'll provide this link to this recording so you can share it with others. Um, I encourage you to go back and look at our past story hours um, on that YouTube page as well, if you have interest in this type of thing. Um, uh, again, many, many th thanks um, for uh, our guests sharing their and our knowledge and experience with us, Adam, Sandy, Lily, Stephen, uh, and Dottie and Christopher um, and Tina, of course. Uh, I just want to say that we'll give uh, Philadelphia Girls Rowing Club, Sophie and Tina, um, yes. a bigger turn later on uh, in yep. the season. Absolutely. Yes. Sorry you didn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will. Don't worry. Um, and so we will um, we will we'll share with you this recording and uh, future story hours. Uh, we hope to have them at least every month to month and a half uh, throughout the year, working our way um, up and down Boathouse Row as each of the clubs and, and, and talking about the clubs that no longer exist as well. We didn't even touch on that tonight. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to in, include those uh, items. But if anybody has any specific questions or thoughts on things that really intrigue them um, about the history um, before and leading up to and, and during Boathouse Row, you can feel free to email um, the info at hosr.org and I will um, be sure that we address this in our committee meetings and our planning meetings before each of the story hours. All right, so thank you to, to everyone. Um, we're so happy that you joined us tonight. Um, mark your calendars for the 53rd uh, HOSR, October 28th and 29th of uh, 2023. We hope that all these story hours are going to culminate in um, in some type of grand, uh, what we hope of, you know, a party uh, where we can, you know, kind of have a little tour along Boathouse Row and, and get everyone to join us in person uh, in October. So again, your thoughts are always welcome and uh, be safe out there. Enjoy the spring weather and the return of baseball season. <laughs> Go Phillies. Jen. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Dottie. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.